three, two. This is your Libertarian Crusaders podcast, and welcome. We have our new uh, guest here with us. Hello, I'm Ryan Dixon. <laughs> <laughs> a recent graduate from the Mises Institute, right? Yeah, Mises University is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Only graduation that really matters. Right? Yeah, yeah. A, and a true education. It was, yeah, it's one of the best weeks of my life when I went there in 2016. And they accept non-traditional students, so there's opportunities for you to, to go as well. Mm. Technically, you could go twice max. My friend Matt Balioli... Um, created that limit because he went four times in a row and then they're like all right so the fdr is that fdr <laughs> that <brand laughs> is the fdr on mises you yeah so he did that uh but ryan went with my brother alvaro and because alvaro's doing some internships and they're like none of these people know economics and he, going to the mises institute university was a way for him to like put on his uh, resume he has economic knowledge and background and understanding um which is all going to tie in Actually, when we talk about the Koch brother that passed away. Well, aren't all human interactions based on economics? Yeah, human action. That's correct. Um, so we're going to start off first by announcing uh, the day for Anarchon 6 for next year. It's going to be August 14th to the 16th. Uh, mark your dates, mark your calendar. I'm sorry, I can't make it. I'm pretty, it's going to be too difficult. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> if you have family visiting, bring them with you, John. <laughs> bring, bring your grandma, you know. <laughs> bring your aunt. It's uh, family friendly. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's really family is. friendly. A lot of family friendly uh, dogs, too. Oh. Uh, there was like a little dog community running around there. This is, <laughs> yeah, it's like what, what, five of them running around. Yeah, it was great. Um, and yeah, this year's was the biggest Anarchon yet. Uh, I stopped by uh, the cabin in the front, and there's people who came in earlier, like uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Some people only were only there for Friday. Some people were only there for Saturday. The total count was 72. And that means next year, for sure, we can break 100. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that's going to be <laughs> a wild, wild time. You know, they say every election is the most important election of our lifetimes, right? So every Anarchon, right. you could argue, is the most important Anarchon of your lifetime. Yeah. Um, every previous attendees for Anarchon, I would say, uh, are ambassadors now to the next Anarchon to bring it for the next group of people who have never been there before. Um, and it's better than, I mean, a lot of uh, conglomeration of ideas from like going to Porkfest. I don't know if you guys have been there or burns and just getting the best of the ideas and kind of putting it all together um but yeah it's a good place to like panzer wants to do it in a conference like a like in a hotel and he's got some you know yeah cool but people like the camping as aspect of it and the communion with, with nature because i think it's uh, there's more things you could do outdoors at a camp than you can in a hotel so you can express yourself a whole lot more out in the right yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you can't make an effigy burn in a hotel. Uh, I think they, you don't have they frown upon that. There's no walls right? out there in the woods. Right, right. <laughs> I think hotels have quiet hours too. Oh. Right. Yeah, yeah, and and you, you know, just like the, it's cheap, it's fun. Everybody's kind of got some camping gear lying around, so there's, right. no, there's no reason not to. And people have camping gear to share too. You know, right. just ask around. <laughs> So Anarchon 6, next year will be our 6th anniversary from the 14th to the 16th. And uh, we already have a lot of people actually want to help planning. Like some people want to bring in, who work at uh, the Grange Winery, want to bring in uh, wine wine tastings to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it'll be a new awesome addition. We're going to try also to get Brad Benat. Yeah, from the School Sucks podcast. We're going to extend an invite out to him more personally than just this. But yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, look forward to that for those who are listening. Uh, so first topic we're going to go over a funny one, Beto O'Rourke, what a, even the name is hilarious. Um, well, his name is Robert, actually, Robert, right. right. His father wanted to call him Beto so he would have more diversity, like seem more diverse. So he's been groomed to be a politician pretty much since he was a child. So maybe a Manchurian <laughs> candidate. Well, really, yeah. even going through like that crazy punk band that was like, uh, what what was they called? It was a very vulgar name or something. Oh, yeah, I, I lose uh, slips my mind, but yeah, it was yeah. a pretty bad name. Um, but he's got a statement saying, talking about, you know, there's uh, we spend like going to a gun show. He's talking about ARs, AR-15s cost three hundred ninety-five dollars a lifetime, guys, a lifetime. 
He says it's more affordable to kill than to stay alive with insulin. And his comparison of that is, uh, you can say, um, even the reverse for anything else, like owning a knife or owning a baseball bat for defense or anything like that. It's cheaper than buying groceries. It's cheaper than other things you'll need. So maybe the market is uh, mispricing those goods too. Um, but yeah, 395. I don't know if I've ever seen a good rifle for 395. <laughs> not <laughs> definitely not. Yeah, semi-auto. Maybe if Cody were here, he would be fired maybe. up about that. <laughs> <laughs> now that's pretty cheap for a, a rifle, uh, especially a semi-auto. A bolt action, you might be able to catch one for that price, a second-hand one. But no, this is obvious that Beto O'Rourke doesn't know what he's talking about and loves government intervention. He went to one gun show and he saw one banner that said 395 bucks for an AR-15 and said, well, this is now the price for all AR-15s. <laughs> right. And it was probably an incomplete lower or right. something like that. <laughs> well, if he's trying to give out recommendations on how to, you know, kill large amounts of people, why doesn't he tell people you can kill people for less than 20 bucks by buying 12, 12 ounce bottles of the, or there's a... 12 packs of Coke, glass Coca-Cola bottles, a gallon of gasoline, and a t- rip up a shirt, and, you know, and you're good. You don't even have to be tw- you don't have to be a certain age to buy those things, you know. So that's true. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Right. And uh, 3.95 for a rifle, but that doesn't count like the ammo you have to get for that, or uh, the range fees that you have to go use sometimes, um, accessories for that, uh, cleaning kits. And yeah, three ninety five sounds like a pretty good deal if it's a great rifle. Background check, which is ten dollars at least in most states. Right. Um, then the thing is, but if why is the price of insulin so high? It's right, because government intervention. Yeah, the, the padding of these <laughs> prices. This isn't the case in other countries where they have even more government intervention. But um, it's because our our pharmaceutical companies are able to lobby the government and engage in cronyism but you also think you know well guns do save lives too not just insulin right so he's not counting the fact that guns so many guns are out there that save lives right i think uh the fda kind of keeps uh is the reason why a lot of the prices for these medicines are kind of the way they are um you can also look at uh what patents things of that nature kind of prevents other companies from making insulin and like they're limits in scope of the production versus the production of like rifles and companies that are out there well yeah that's why the ar-15 is the most popular rifle because once the patent became un it wasn't patented any longer then every company could make their version of it mm-hmm. and so you get every single flavor of the rifle out there that you want mm-hmm. uh yeah that's i guess something that uh people don't realize i guess like the government meddling into the kind of these markets or the healthcare. Uh, especially the FDA abolished that one already. Right? And I think by him, you know, using the comparison of insulin as it being so expensive, it's just him playing on, you know, people's feelings about, you know, the health of humans, you know, because almost everybody probably knows at least one person that has diabetes. And by him saying that, you know, the cost of diabetes is, you know, to be treating your diabetes or at least just maintaining it is this, you know, large number. It's just like, wow, you could kill people with that, you know, that num- amount you're spending each month. And it's just, it's all just mental gymnastics that he's trying to pull on everybody. <laughs> yeah. And then there's a lot of like generic drugs that are pretty cheap now, right? And uh, like the like pain medicines and things like that, right? That the competition through the market kind of drove them down. And then there's a lot of, uh, maybe it'll do the same thing with the rifles, right? I don't know how much rifles cost like 20 years ago versus today. But, you know, you, I think there's uh, something to said about that. Um, but yeah, something about rifles, I think... Um, in terms of saving lives, I think that's something that very much the people in Hong Kong would very much would like to have, right? Uh, you guys seen the uh, ways that like they've taken over the airports, uh, right? Or the ways that they're taking it down the uh, face recognition towers, yeah, the surveillance towers, surveillance towers, and yeah. using umbrellas as shields, right? <laughs> <laughs> operating in groups to block tear gas. Oh, imagine how fearful the Chinese government would be if they had to. Occupy Hong Kong, and instead of all of the stuff that's currently there, there was just a zillion AR-15s all over the place in all the buildings, <laughs> and everybody poking one out of a window and shooting at them. They would they would say this is not it's not happen. worth it. This is why Hitler <laughs> didn't take over Switzerland. It was just uh, this is like his uh, advisor. It's like we could take it, but we're going to lose a lot of people. 
a substantial amount of our forces are going to be gone. So it's probably not worth a, uh, a, any kind of strategy to take over. And if you, now that you see like the throngs of Hong Kongians or Hong Kongers uh, allied together in unison for this sort of stuff, I think that's a, it's an amazing good group cohesion or tribalism you see that they don't want to be part of China. Um, this makes you ask, like, maybe Hong Kong would have been better under British rule, right? And I think they're kind of clamoring that it was nicer to be under uh, Western influences than it is to be under one such as China right now under a communist state. I would um, say that, yeah, that was in just having their own island and being able to rebel them from getting there is better. And I would say that... Now that <clears throat> industrial machining and precision machining is pretty much down to the individual level, if these people want to rebel in every way possible, the means is totally there, especially because China's the one that manufactures a lot of this stuff and they have access to all this technology. So right. we'll see if they pull it off or if it's just some you know, limited hangout. I'm interested to see how the Chinese media is going to actually like cover, you know, what's going on in Hong Kong and how they're going to actually treat and say, you know, like see if they're going to treat them as like some type of like terrorist group, you know, the people that are living in Hong Kong or like, you know, how they're going to actually like show the people living in China how, you know, what these people are actually doing. And I think it's probably going to be a big propaganda campaign on their part. Right. And that's the thing that sets them against China. Everybody has cell phones, right? It was very easy to do it if it was Tiananmen Square and just run them all over, right? right. There wasn't a lot of media attention out there. It was very difficult to get news out or in. Uh, nowadays, I mean, they have a lot of restrictions, sure, but it's, people can still get access to what's going on in other places and parts of the world. And especially in Hong Kong, uh, having more freedom in terms of that kind of access and broadcasting it to the world right now uh, doesn't make them look good. It uh, would be a bad PR thing, especially if they ever try to go for, like, say, another Olympics or something like that, and they have, like, a now it's visible of a negative record if they're trying to run over people with tanks. Right. So what do you guys think their move is going to be with China? Do you think they're going to move in militarily? Do you think the... the uh, I think that... Um, it would be a shame if they did that. I think that there's definitely some some uh, CIA U.S. government involvement over there. Whether we like it or not, I think there's always there's always some level. There's always some CIA out there. But in this case, I think a lot of these people are being influenced, uh, and I think the actual issues that they're they're complaining about are not as sympathy inducing as say pulling down surveillance cameras. Like, we can all get behind that. But the ones where they don't want to extradite this guy who murdered someone in Taiwan, you know, it seems like an odd thing to get rustled up over. The problem began when the Brits decided to do this 99-year lease and uh, switch power over to China because inevitably that meant the Chinese were going to come in and, right. and uh, bring in whatever authoritarian regime. The Brits have just reneged on that contract, right? I think uh, it would have been a war with China in 1997, well, I, I guess. That, <laughs> <laughs> that would have been, been an interesting one. I mean, um, the Argentinians thought that they could take on the Brits, and the Brits did take some heavy losses. I was like looking over that documentary over the island of like Fodacor or something like that off of Argentina. Um, but it would have um, at least uh, secured that area. I don't think like even like the Chinese would even don't even want a war. From what like we were. Right. listening to at the anti-war peace and prosperity run pause event uh they don't want a war uh it seems like a lot of stuff i see from china like all their stuff is still outdated i mean they have the men they have like the marches for their goose stepping or something like you know it makes it look like there's like like yeah that's like how can you take out all that people but their stuff in with china is just uh kind of reminds me of, like north korea where like they have to photoshop things to make it seem like they're they have like the most advanced weaponry um and with china I don't really see them. Well, if the British were to renege, renege on the contract, I think they should have. I think you see now the outcome of that. I think uh, the Hong Kongians are, are clamoring to go back in there. But at least it's a testament, I think. Um, well, if they don't do it themselves, then what good is it? If you don't work for it yourself, if the Hong Kongers don't like toss this tyranny off themselves, if somebody comes and helps them, are they going to value it like they should? Yes, this is now... Because look at what a, the U.S. is going through right now. There's people going out advocating against free speech, against 
bearing arms, all these things. Mm -hmm. None of these people had to work to gain any of these. So do they, is that because they, they never had to work for it that they take it for granted or so may like, obviously we don't think that the U S should be intervening, uh, bless black budgets or anything like that. Hong Kongers have to do it themselves. I think. Right. I think what's what's going to be the most important thing is like I think China's smart enough to know not to be not to overstretch into a sense of that it will want the West to you know aggress towards them you know China China knows that they should not militarily get involved because you know they don't want to start this global war and unfortunately with that you know uh, time limited you know independent you know state you know you you don't want to have to like. They, the communist government had been growing and growing and growing outside of them while they were like counting down that time. So that's an unfortunate circumstance of that contract. But I think that China's smart enough not to really push. Expose themselves. Yeah. 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 Overplay their hand. There's so many Mm -hmm. moments. That's good. I think that's the best, right? Like if we force them to use diplomacy versus force, Mm -hmm. this is strictly a better world than what we like it used to be. Oh, conquer. Right. Now we're like, oh, well, we have this camera. You're on watch now. Exactly. Well, that was one of the points Rick Sanchez made yesterday is that, uh, or one of the good points he made was that the he's an rt guy from uh we're gonna be releasing that episode next week i guess yeah, so, TV. Um, but yeah he's with R- to rt and uh he made the point that in south america when we engage in these interventions a lot of these guys like fidel castro or whoever end up in power after we attempted but failed will say see i protected you from united states imperialism those are the bad guys i was the, and so it just it gives them more power and legi- and legitimizes them more so the that's the the double side the the um you know the the problem with it is that we can get involved and then we don't know what the unintended consequence will be in hong kong ultimately that was one thing um that we did touch upon the other the other day well so i was thinking american intervention like when when is it justified right was it justified in world war one and they shouldn't have gone in it led to world war two that's true right um, what about um, uh, when it's already too late and now you have World War II, so they still have gone in, all right? Um, maybe, all right? Uh, what about uh, during our American Revolution? We had the French intervene, and it helped us out. It did not help out the French. It bankrupted their entire country. <laughs> and that entire country got bankrupt to the point where it went to the wholesale onslaught of Catholics everywhere. Right. Because they wanted a new revolution that had an allegiance to the state, and the Catholics didn't have an allegiance to the state, and they had an allegiance to God, and they found that as competition, and so they drowned uh, like families and everybody in, in boats and rivers, and they went after a priest to say, if you don't make your new uh, allegiance, then you know, you're dead. And so nobody talks about that reign of terror of France, and so, yeah, the unintended consequences uh, of state intervention. Um, maybe, maybe, yeah, Napoleon had to sell this huge swath. Of, right. Not not too long later, you know, to Thomas Jefferson. So you think, how much better off could the French? And also, you look at like World War One and World War Two from the British perspective too. Like they could have been so much more better off if they hadn't been handing out these war guarantees, and, right? And everything. So even from their own perspective, they would have been. They shouldn't have done it. Right. And we would have been fine. Right. You know, we would have eventually beaten the Brits. Maybe 10 years, it would have taken a little bit longer. So, All right. I say we, but... You know. <laughs> yeah, how did we end up helping the Brits in World War I? I thought we were not uh, cool with them for a while, right? It was, it was the Northeastern establishment uh, elites who did fancy themselves. Like, oh, no, we're very comfortable. Like the J.P. Morgans and uh, people like that who... <clears throat> had a lot of investments in the, the UK, globalists, right. if I guess, you will. Right. I guess because we won in that revolutionary war, we felt like, all right, we can help you. If we had lost, if there was no French intervention, and we had lost that war, I know event- inevitably there would have been another one, but I think there would have been a, so much more animosity against the British for losing that war, for losing a lot of lives and a lot of resentment that uh, when the inevitable World War I would have broken out, we would have been like, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> that would have changed everything. Well, and then you look at like 
people like Alexander Hamilton and, you know, various other founding fathers, you know, they, they still had that sentiment for, you know, England after the Revolutionary War and stuff. So, I mean, you know, you mean look at Woodrow Wilson, 100 years after the, you know, the anniversary of the Revolutionary War, he said that America would have been better off with, under British rule, you know. So, I mean, they had, there's, some of the presidents have their agenda, you know, already set in their mind when they become president, and it, it, it shows <laughs> in the future. Under British rule, we would not have had a civil war, um, maybe. Well, no, the argument saying that it was for slavery would not have been there. They would have banned, well, who knows if they would have banned it if they still had us under the, as colonies. Because the British, British uh, Empire banned slavery, and it would have extended here to the Americas. But would they have done that if... If they, we were still under them, right? Under them. Yeah, they, they banned it in, uh, in India and all, their, in all of India. I, I ran into this guy who was telling me, I like bringing this up because it's hilarious. It was hilarious for me because he was saying like, well, India stopped uh, slavery before the U.S. And I was like, uh, like I, was, I was talking about like, you know, the start started off in England through these uh, Christians. And it's like, no, I'm Indian did it uh, ended before the U.S. Like we did our own, our own. And I was like, I was like, huh. So I went back and did some research like, yeah, they did it on their own because the British controlled all of India. Hmm. And through the um, East Indian Company and through many other uh, avenues of British uh, uh, conquering that area, they said no more slavery. And that is why India stopped slavery. It wasn't through their own volition and going through their own kind of their own moral judgments and kind of looking internally and saying this is not how we should behave towards another human being. And they reached that enlightenment. Uh, it was brought to them. And much in the same way, like with Hong Kong. And uh, I mean, it's not just... I thought it was like one island. It's a lot of little islands. There's a mainland island, little islands. But it was uh, British coming in here and then establishing these uh, Western traditions and the way how markets should be run that the uh, Hong, Hong Kongers adopted that, embraced that. It's like, this is great. Less intervention in our lives. They're frequently rated like number one on the World Economics uh, Freedom Index Report, mm. right? Um, so there has to be something to be said there in terms of like the West is the best, that even the East. Uh, adopts it and embraces it and uh and they and that's kind of what they want to continue to hold on to they turn from uh an island of uh sweatshops to uh, an island of skyscrapers like and in, they had to no go through small that, amount of time and, they, and people don't uh, you know like it but they had to go through that period of sweatshops right to get to right the period right of there's, there's no you know, there's an in between right? right and if you look at a lot of the large cities in china they're modeled off of what hong kong is and was you know growing up to what you know what it is now like the special economic zones like shanghai and stuff like they are built off of that so it's kind of a, if they it's, it's almost <clears throat> symbolic if they destroy if they want if they do try to attack hong kong it'll be it, it could be bad luck in the demise of their special economic zones and lose the their vision of what they had for the future with those areas of uh, free, free markets in there. Well, <laughs> if Hong Kong succeeds too, it's also oh, yeah. a, a blueprint blueprint for rebellion as right. well. Like, <laughs> like, you, know, like, you know, Hong Kong's an island, so it's a little bit strategically different, but right. uh, still, you got the basics. Is there airdrop uh, leaflets on how to build your own AR-15? Well, <laughs> <laughs> just airdrop them. Airdrop, airdrop like that's players. how they're communicating. I think airdrop's uh, an Apple app or something like right. that. That's how they're communicating. <laughs> oh, wow. Because mm. they've started to try to crack down on a lot of ways that uh, they'll communicate back and forth. So, And you got to be, re I feel like that's just a good thing to be ready for ahead of time, but, you know, before the clampdown to have ulterior motives of communication, you know? Right. That was, I think Twitter was a big one for in Iran a while ago. And then Twitter started doing some weird stuff after that. But speaking of sweatshops and how bad people think that is sometimes, let's bring up to um, the Koch brothers. <laughs> Who are synonymous with sweatshops. <laughs> <laughs> the founder of sweatshops. <laughs> All, now that they? he's dead, all the sweatshops just disappeared. Right. <laughs> How dare they? How dare they? What was the what's the eternal to sweatshops? <laughs> all right, maybe starvation or something like that. Um, I forgot his name. I think uh, Samuel Powell from the Mises Institute. Uh, he did the research and led the way. Like, there's a lot of arguments saying like sweatshops are bad and all this stuff. Like, and look at the the way they question these people there. It's like this is kind of faulty research. He's like, let me go visit these places myself. And so he went down to many sweatshops and, um, and in person asked uh, them the same questions, but asked them like, we'll say like, would you like more pay 
um, would you like uh, less hours, you know, with the same pay? And you're like, yeah, of course, All right? Would you like uh, better conditions? You're like, yeah, I love better conditions. <laughs> would, would you like uh, longer lunch breaks? You'll probably say, yeah, absolutely. Um, would you like a uh, bigger room to do work? But, and then he'll ask the other questions, but uh, less pay. And like, uh, no, I'm good. How about, would you like uh, less hours, right? But less pay. Or would you like, uh, like an improvement, better conditions, but less, but less pay. pay? And they're like, yeah, no, we, we want the pay. <laughs> yeah, the pay is pretty good. The pay is actually substantially higher than the national average for any other similar industries or in the same range of what they're doing all across those countries. And that's the, uh, the cost way of uh, benefit analysis that these people take under, get, undergo for themselves. That's why those companies start those, those sweatshops where they are, because there, there would be no other economic incentive to do it. Right. So it's so cheap to do it there. And these people end up choosing those jobs over virtually every other job they could possibly right. get in that country. And if you look at how poverty has dropped significantly in the last, what, like 50 years or even like the last 100 years even, it's just significantly just dropped from, you know, from the beginning of the 100 years till now it is because of companies outsourcing to other countries. So the product is cheaper and the labor is cheaper. And it's also bringing people, you know, able to just survive and eat and live, you know, and you look, even when you're going back to China, people will travel from inland China to major cities and just work there and then send the money back to their families. And those families are able to live now because of those incentives of traveling to those, you know, sweatshops. Are you saying you don't want to pay a hundred dollars more for those shoes? I, mean, I don't know. It, it depends on it depends on you know my mood. And what I want with them, you know, public demand for cheaper goods forces these people, these companies, to go overseas to find cheaper ways to provide those uh, demands and that kind of uh, desire for cheaper goods. It's not like they want to. All right, we're gonna pack everything up and we're gonna go take this tremendous journey to go overseas. Like nobody wants to do that. But there's such a big demand for cheaper products. Like, all right, well, we'll do it, and you know, you're gonna enjoy it. It's gonna be a hundred dollars less for a pair of sneakers, mm-hmm. uh, and that's that's why they go over there. Yeah, if you ever watch uh, um, that show where they're the oh the Shark Tank, Shark Tank. Uh, yeah, and um, one of the points that Mister Wonderful always makes is that he's like, I want to bring this to China. I want to have the manufacturing done over there, and then I want to, you know, and and the point he's always making is that it just crushes the costs. Like right. people always want to be made in the USA and invariably it's killing their margins. And so they so can't. there's virtue signaling and counter virtue signaling, right? But because most people are ignorant of actual economics, right? Because people don't sit down and read the basics, like the Frederick Bastiat's, the, if goods don't cross borders, soldiers will, because right now we're in a mm. trade war with China. There's, you know, so this is why now I think that uh, this is coming to the forefront of the American media and it exposes that they're basically just a mouthpiece for the state, I think. I think um, because the Hong Kong protests have been going on for a few weeks and only now has it been a thing. Right. You know, they got... They're sick of talking about Jeffrey Epstein and all right. the other stuff. So. so they killed him off. So he can yeah. talk about something else. Retired, <laughs> they retired that, that persona. It's, I don't know if he's dead, but that persona is retired. All right. <laughs> so what do you guys think about the Koch brothers? Because in terms of like talking about uh, there's a lot of uh, economics that they don't know. There's also a lot of uh, history of this particular person who's affected a lot of things. Uh, in our lives, I will say, things that we've engaged with, especially in the Libertarian Party with other Libertarians, uh, especially with uh, the founder of, you could say, Libertarianism with uh, Murray Rothbard, uh, and things outside of that, even with like uh, the Tea Party and everything. Um, or if you're, uh, if you have cancer or something, he's engaged in cancer research with uh, John Hopkins University, you know? Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, him? Because he just passed away, uh, David Cooks. Just passed right. away. The younger brother. 79. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's um, I mean, he's done a lot of good for a lot of people. He's employed a lot of people. All the people who've worked for him that I've talked to like him and, and really thought he was a great guy. So, like, it, regardless of whatever internecine um, dip rivalries occurred in the libertarian movement or whatever, you ha- still have to think, like, wow, the guy, like, moved the needle really far in our direction. So, why... Uh, 
uh, but then you see on Twitter the response to him, and it's just pure vitriol and hatred and bile. So, right, unfortunate. Yeah, I never personally met him, so I, I don't know him <laughs> at all. <laughs> he put his money what he was interested in, and like he used his influence, and one of the influences he had was money. And I don't fault a person for that. You know, I hope to have some money someday that I can put into things that I like. It's just like what I try to I use my time and attention on things I'm interested in. If I had money also to put into that, that's what I would do. So can't fault him for that. All right. I would rather have somebody put money towards, you know, spreading, you know, free market, you know, economics at, you know, donating it to places like George Mason University than to donate money to places like the Atlantic Council that just wants to spread war propaganda and, you know, instigate us into things, you know, so right. it depends on what, you know, if you'd rather have someone spread, you know, want to push to, you know, kill more people, then, you know, go ahead and support that, you know, but I think that, you know, he using that term philanthropist is, you know, it is an open word, but, you know, when you look at see where he put his money at, it's, it's not, it wasn't to right. end right. people's lives as some people, you know, <laughs> like to do. Right? Yeah, I thought the left hated war, right? Mm. It was very much anti-war. It was very much anti-Bush Senior and all the Middle Eastern wars, uh, which some say that uh, was like a response for his engagement to get into politics um, in the beginning. And you'll find uh, all that is very easily neglected or looked over by leftists. And they think that's because he has a billion dollars, he's automatically an evil man. All right. I mean, Bernie Sanders has three houses and a multimillionaire. I mean, Obama just bought a new house in Martha's Vineyard. That is like, and it's just like, you want to talk about, you know, when you, go on, when you go on speaking tours where you get paid a million dollars each speech and talk about income inequality, right. like that, is that's a little bit contradictory there, buddy. <laughs> I think um, uh, when I first heard, I didn't know much about him, but I looked at um, his influences and the things that he's affected and, and funded in terms of like the uh, Students for Liberty that uh, we go to. Uh, I've been going there for consecutively. I had my suspicions about it in the first year, but after the second year, it's like, all right, it's a legit good organization. I'm always skeptical about everything. That's how I go in with everything <laughs> until they prove me. It's like, all right, you're good, legit, all right. Um, and they fund that. They fund that a lot. Uh, they put a lot of money to like students uh, going to seminars and going to workshops and learning about um, Frederick Bastia, learning about uh, all these uh, very important um, uh, economists. And I think that's great. Um, I think people have contention with, um, well, they're not putting all their money into the Libertarian Party exactly, right? Um, but they have their own, but it's their money. And they sometimes feel yeah. maybe there's a better way to strategize and how this money should go towards something that will reap a better uh, return think, of investments. Yeah, I think they go for like issue based things. So just, re just this week where I was talking to some people about, uh, that are associated with, uh, Americans for prosperity for right. trying to tackle this export import bank issue and talk to your local representative. And in our case, ours might be more receptive, but you just say, Hey, this thing, you need to let it sunset and, uh, get rid of it because it's a, another crony capitalist, like, program that benefits large corporations at the expense of taxpayers and blah, blah, blah. So you offer that and uh, that's what they're doing. So you can't really argue with that, you know, right. For whatever other issues you might disagree with them on. So. Right. <laughs> I like the, uh, the background stuff though. It's interesting. I think, uh, like the, the beef with Rothbard, um, and maybe we can not overlook that, right. uh, or with the Mises Institute, I think, uh, um, what I've found and read is something to the fact that Rothbard wanted to create something that could propel more of the libertarian philosophy uh, before it became political, uh, and they kind of nudged him and wedged him out of that because uh, he was going to do the intellectual side of the Cato Institute that he was a member of, that he founded, and that kind of went against uh, them trying to see if they could uh, politicize that and reach out to the masses. Because uh, I have to say, yeah, libertarian does work for a lot of nerds. We're, we're nerds, essentially. We, we like to read. Right? It's, it's a movement of nerds. Yeah. Um, the there's not a lot of people who still read books these days. And we ask them what kind of books they're reading. They're reading Harry Potter books, right? Uh, anything more than 50 pages is like, eh, they kind of look over. Um, the stuff that we read, though, yeah, high-level stuff. You, you kind of have to like and love history and um, numbers and math. And uh, so it's thinking. Thinking. <laughs> I think that this is a big part with the people that are like celebrating his death. These are the same people I would 
group lump them with they think that you have to be told what to think not that right. you can think for yourself they don't think that the normal people have discernment or anything like this so i that's what i feel like and so and they're just the loudest people so they'll be screaming and making a fool of themselves and that's great i think because it exposes them and uh yeah we can shun them right they should be shunned there's been a very big growing movement in vilifying entrepreneurs and by vilifying entrepreneurs that's opening up new avenues for innov- innovations but also opening up new avenues for employment and by vilifying you know him as just being somebody that you know had you know just lots and lots of money he got that from working you know he got that from putting his ma- money where his you know brain in his mouth is and was doing and then gave it back to people and he doesn't just, have to do that. Yeah, exactly. Right. He you never know? had to get involved. He can just right. live and disappear and just be a wealthy freaking person, like one of a rare person. He just do whatever he wants, right? Uh, he could be a billionaire and, and not so much like uh, Epstein, but there's no connections with an Epstein. He never, that's not something he wanted to be a part of. There's, no, there's nothing out there of any kind of trail of being into this Lolita Express with right. Bill Clinton or being uh, anywhere associated with him. Uh, and I think uh, sometimes maybe people who feel like they have so much money, so much power, they can do anything they want, and he, that's not in his direction or part of his virtue as a person. Um, I can't fault people who say who, who try to intervene to the state and try to do politics, but at least his direction and that needle towards freedom is very much in the interest that we want to head to. And even though he may have had some beef with Rothbard, I'm glad it happened. Mises Institute would have never been founded. Sure. <laughs> Otherwise. And you know, every, nobody's perfect. Mm-hmm. Like everybody has little disagreements and things. And you look at um, the way that the media and all these people respond to j- the death of John McCain, for instance. Right. And then <laughs> just compare that response to what you see with somebody like David Koch, or eventually it'll be Ron Paul or whoever. You right. Know, and you no. think, oh, I'm sure they'll. I'm, not ready I'm sure they'll day. do the same thing. No. You know. So I, I won't. I won't do that. And. Uh, Obviously, somebody like as evil as John McCain, you can't, you can't, there's nothing you can find that can say, well, uh, he, he was a good guy. You yeah. know? <laughs> it's like to kill a lot of people. I mean, <laughs> which, did, which, did David Koch or John McCain have pictures, you know, posing, with, posing for a camera with terrorists, you know? Right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Literal terrorists. Right. High level, like organizing terrorists. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think, uh, and there's always going to be crow and beef, but at least these people are still have the aim and direction of freedom. Um, they may have a different way of looking how that might be achieved, or but their aim and direction, their compass points in that direction. And I think that's good. I think the you look at the founding fathers themselves. A lot of them had quarrels with each other. John Quincy Adams hated Thomas Jefferson, uh, like for all their lives. Like they just snipe at each other all the time. And it wasn't until like near the last several years of their lives that they like, you know what? All right, you're, you're an all right guy. <laughs> Well, like, in uh, the Quincy Institute is an organization, anti-war organization that was just recently started by Charles Koch and mm. uh, George Soros. Interestingly, right? But, right. So you see that, and uh, you think, okay, you know, that's that's they, they're putting a crap load of money into that. Mm-hmm. So, what, what's so horrible about that? Right. Right. And I mean, like, with you know, like getting back to Murray Rothbard, back in you know, when Vietnam War was going on, he said the best, you know, you know, internet wasn't around then, so like the best way to spread anti-war stuff was you know, crossing the boundaries of left and right, you know, and you know, there's definitely you know, you will you will always disagree with someone on something, but being able to understand what principles you're looking for, especially when it comes to not murdering people, you know, you can work together on that t- that idea, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, of course, you know, you, you it would be nice and. With that whole idea of anti-war, you're able to incorporate so much of the libertarian philosophy into it after, you know, you meet those, meet those grounds of anti-war. All right. Maybe this is why objectivism didn't get too far. Because uh, <laughs> they're a, a cut-dry sort of thing. I used to be cut-dry like that. Um, but I find um, my mature age and time, it's like, if I find more values, like 90% of the we agree, I'm good with that. Um, again, the left agrees with anyone who wants to like take from others, um, at least with anyone generally from the right or objectivist for, for these areas, like, yeah, they, that's not generally what they want or desire. Well, they don't have any principles. So the second you do disagree with them, they'll, they'll use this apparatus that they've built, this snitch culture and they'll weaponize it against you. So 
I, I found it more useful to find people with principles and then just build up a relationship from there on that. That'll be our beacon to shine through. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, see how that shines. Right? Yeah. And with Rothbard doing that himself, he uh, like created a huge thing out of that, right? So like you think that after being kicked out of the Cato Institute that uh, he wouldn't do anything. They were hoping he wouldn't do anything. And I was like, no, we're going to go after uh, Ludwig von Mises and we're going to venerate him. He's got a great stuff. That was his mentor, pretty much. And we're going to create our own institute. And uh, I read something about like the Cato people calling him. It's like, what are you guys doing? Like, don't, don't compete against <laughs> right. us. Right. Right. Um, I mean, look at the Cato Institute, too. At the same time, what were... protectionists like. <laughs> <really>? <laughs> Yeah, I think... Get Rothbard, over yourselves, for real. He wanted, to, he wanted to do the purest thing, right? He wanted to stick to where this the is going to be an anarchist, right. like, you know, thinking. And, uh, yeah, they, they, the Cokes clearly didn't want to be anarchists. And right. That was never going to happen. So. Right. They're, thinking, they're, they're looking for a way that the masses could be palatable for the masses. Uh, Rothbardians and stuff like that are really already for people who are already nerds. Uh, and can understand this stuff. Like, if I, if I were to give you like uh, some facts, you're like, "This is logical." Okay, I will proceed efficiently in that direction, right? Not everyone's like that. That's really, I would say, a really tiny few people. Um, and so, I think that Rothbard's message uh, reaches out to that. I think the Mises Institute reaches out to that. Uh, people who are very logical and efficient and read all their facts and read everything and back check everything, and, and uh, that's the attraction to it. And I think that's great. Those are great people. I, I think. think Go ahead. I think deep down, everybody has, you know, everybody's human. And I think human nature is, you know, just something that everybody is, it's just, it's just there. And eventually, you know, I have hope that, you know, people that don't, you know, want libertarian ideas in, you know, society, I think it'll eventually come to them, you know, come to their heart and understand, you know, whether it be from, you know, some mass war or whether it just be from realizing that like maybe we should just end the war on drugs and then you know all this coercion you know just it all just domino effect of you know the consistencies of you know libertarianism yeah, yeah. well they say everyone's born a libertarian until it's beaten out of them or brainwashed out of them <laughs> schooled <laughs> out right um and then depending on the culture if that's more libertarian you stand a chance which is why libertarianism proliferates greatly in the West. And I think that's no coincidence, looking at China right now, right? And looking at Hong Kong, wishing they were still under Western influence, at least that kind of allegiance. Uh oh. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Car honk. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I learned a lot from him passing away and me reading more about the Koch brothers. And apparently this guy wasn't even the most political one <laughs> that was active out of all of them. Support of the arts. Right, supported yeah. the arts, uh, supported the Tea Party, which you would think the left would be greatly for because the Tea Party was about uh, kicking out career Republicans, it was about uh, revamping the entire Republican Party and kicking out all these people and all these uh, old drones out there and just re re reinvigorating it with new, better ideas towards like, let's go back to free markets. Uh, and they're responsible for funding all of that. And I think with having, you know, pushing the want, wanting to either have lower taxes or no taxes at all, you'll have people, you'll have more people wanting to come out and be philanthropists because they realize, you know, they're like, we can, I can do good with this money because it's not forcibly going to malinvestment of resources into, you know, healthcare and all, you know, anything, you know, and by being, by, you know, when you want to donate something, when you're not forced to donate something, you're going to want to donate more. And by you know, promising these services, people are like, oh, I've already done my fair share to society, so I don't need to donate of my money. You know, I've already got, I'm getting you know, 20, 30% of my you know, what, income taken away from the government. So, yeah, the yeah. U.S. government never sends you a picture, like an updated picture yeah. of the child that you helped. <laughs> feed, uh -huh. you know, whereas like nonprofits will kill you. They're keeping me updated. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> My father did that once, uh, some girl in India, and it was always showing me pictures of her growing up and him like giving money and show her, show her write, writing letters and like, uh, thank you for much so much, that's helped me out. And then like eventually she got to the point where she got married and she had kids, uh, some person in India. And these are, and he's a Catholic. So it seems like Catholics are generally the most philanthropic group in, in the America and so are the Coach Brothers. So stuff that I disagree with them, of course. I think, uh, the area, I think they're pro-abortion rights or something like that. 
Um, they're pro open borders, but again, 90% of everything else, I'm good on board. The other 10%, we may disagree, but let's reach the 90% here and we can see how we can like secede and separate that and see how better off we'll be with the rest of the 10%. And you look at today's political scene, it's like pro abortion and you know, pro open borders is the biggest two topics that, you know, the left wants. And by attacking the, the attacking attacking coach attacking David Coach just shows that like that's inconsistent with you know, right. he, he wants those things to happen for people you know and it's like why do you why are you praising yeah. that you know you want his brother to die now too I right think. yeah Jesus Christ well and he's right. not yeah he's not in on the program so yeah. if you're not in on the full program if you're if you doubt any part of it you're an enemy I think Bernie Sanders said. That's a Koch brothers proposal when he when they talked open about bars. open borders. Yep. <laughs> they asked him whether he supported open borders. But you look at like old footage of like Obama and he's saying, Yeah, close borders, like open borders ridiculous. Like you can well, pay that back to them. All the children's camps were built by Obama right. and implemented those photos by Obama. That, yeah, those photos are like children in cages. That happened under Obama. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Well, oh and my then God. You, you look at why people are coming from other, you know, other countries, you know, south of us or anywhere, really. It's because of the government, you know, trying to either overthrow, you know, throwing Ooh, kids in their, in their, you know, government or just straight up just killing people in their, you know, where they are. So, I mean, if, if we weren't involved in so many other countries, you, you wouldn't have people wanting to come here to you know, run away from us in their country to come here, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's scary We, we destabilized, I, uh, that was another point Rick Sanchez made mm -hmm. yesterday, was that we destabilized Honduras, we kicked out the old guy in 2009, and um, Zelaya, and that's one of the most crime-ridden, horrible places to live, and prior to that it had been a great place to live, and they were, they were on the up, up and up, and now we're getting all these folks from Honduras coming here. But um, the thing is weird though, that the people, they, like the CIA influences, there's usually a handful of people, right? So there's a tiny amount of like 100 people, and they'll affect the policies. But the rest of Honduras is like in the millions, or I don't know how many populations in there, but it only takes like 100 people, for, for example, that the CIA influences, and that will destroy and wreck the economy. I think it has to be something to be said about maybe the people that can resist that kind of corruption themselves and go against just a hundred politicians, right? Because they outnumber them, and reclaim that, and take and prevent that sort of nonsense from taking over and from pushing to a point where they feel like this is not a good place for us. All right. And that's where I think universal gun laws is just perfect for any type of society. You know, if you have the United States coming over to try and take you over, you know, you have just those guns and are ready to <laughs> ready to blast them. <laughs> Get the hell out, Gringo. <laughs> 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 well, and, uh, you know, as we learned with the election of Donald Trump, there is, it, don't, it doesn't take that many Russians to affect the outcome of our election. Right, oh, yeah. right. <laughs> so. And they didn't have to use, you know, millions of dollars in black budgets and run up you know, twenty one trillion dollars in debt and they just had to buy a hundred thousand bucks worth of Facebook ads. Right. And uh that's all it took to right. get Donald Trump elected. So <laughs> <laughs> I never hear a lot of people complain about the CIA Facebook operatives or these are just USA bots. Um I think it's funny, Hong Kong wants USA bots right now. They're seeing the Star Spangled Banner out there. They're out there waving the American flag. Um, I love America. I love Americans. I love the culture. I love the history. I love our principles. Um, even the Constitution, which it was founded in general, far advancement in terms of like comparing to everything else that's been passed in the world history of humankind for the thousands of years. Such great advancement. Uh, you can love your country. You can also not like your government, right? And I think uh, Hong Kongians, uh, Hong Kongers are showing that and waving the American flag like we want those principles. We want the Second Amendment. We want these things. Uh, and I think that's great. And then, of course, you compare that to what's happening like in Portland where they're waving the communist flag. And they're like, uh, yeah, we want uh, collectivism. And like tribalism is great. But at least in tribalism, there is a way for you to still value the individual and push up uh, the one person, right? And, and everyone to be sparkle their own magic. But in that collectivism, there is no way anyone can do that. Uh, and so you have these like Antifa people out there waving those flags, and then you compare the people actually facing up against communism, and they're not embracing them warmly as Portland people would want them to be. 
And think of how fearless these Hong Kongers are when they're tearing down this surveillance thing. Mm -hmm. And they're they're using umbrellas to block their identity because it's real over there. It's not Mm -hmm. fun and games. Like, you have a police department in Portland that won't won't kick your ass if you're a uh, commie, but right. you will get your ass kicked over there, you know, by, right. by real, real people. Yeah. Yeah. So. And see the inconsistencies with Antifa with, you know, they want to, they throw hammers at people just for, you know, just protesting the same way that they are. But then, you know, they don't get in trouble. They don't, you know, the cops aren't, you yeah. know, in, you know, harassing them for, you know, assaulting others, but, you know, they want to take away everybody else's guns, but the ones with the guns are protecting them and, and the whole time of them be assaulting people. Is... Well, in Antifa, if you ever watch any of the, like, in-depth videos, they always deflect. They always tell the cops, why are you def- why are you protecting these white nationalists? Oh. Aren't you guys white? And it's hilarious. Like, wow, the, the, the backwards thinking that you have to go through just to... They prey on your civility. They prey on your... Uh, kindness they prey on your mannerisms uh they prey on uh, the way that you respect people like sometimes they'll say like when like there's a whole video where like this guy spits in the face of this guy and says and the guy's like like what the hell is this dude and he's like well i'm trans i'm a woman you can't hit a woman all right <laughs> uh and so they are not part of the western civilization culture western civilization does respect it which is why the guy didn't hit him back hit the, the dude back the guy back because he, he does that, and it's like maybe a weird quirk in his mind. It's like, yeah, I, I respect women, and they're trying to prey upon that. They're trying to prey upon our civility and our civilized ways that we have come f- so far from like thousands of years where that was never the case. And uh, I think that's uh, something to kind of highlight. Um, and Hong Kongians seem to want that civility uh, versus what happens on the other side when those tanks start rolling. And hopefully they don't. Yeah, um, I think uh, the propulsion of media has done a lot of good job to kind of showcase this, and maybe that might be the way to create more peace through diplomacy. All right, nobody wants to see those images. I think that's kind of what helped uh, end the Vietnam War. You can say with all those body bags coming home and all these uh, people dying. They're on camera now. Finally, mm-hmm. you can see viscerally what is happening, and then you had all those protests against that. If you didn't have the media, you wouldn't. Nobody would have known. It probably would have continued even longer. And it just goes to show how the mass media is. You know, now you know you don't have CNN. You don't have. You know, you have. You know, maybe one or two people on like Fox News. But you know, you won't have these huge corporations going out to where you know America is conducting war at because they don't want people to know what they're doing to other countries because they are getting funded by the people who are selling the weapons to the government. Right. So it's just this big complex of industries that is controlling what people know and then once you actually you know find these independent journalists and stuff that are doing amazing work risking their lives going out there to see what other what america is doing to other countries you know it's it's eye-opening and you know that's that's what america needs more than these you know corporate giants just you know there's nothing wrong with corporations don't get me wrong but when they're in in bed with the government it's it becomes it becomes a monopoly in a nope. sense those aren't corporations that's a self-licking ice cream can uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. right right it's raytheon and they're, they're and like if you watch all these media giants they're all the commercials are it's either a my pillow it's prescription drugs or it's boeing raytheon bae you know that's what their ads my father are. worked for raytheon general dynamics yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's obvious where their money. I there was uh, an interview. Marianne Williamson was talking with Anderson Art Girl. Cooper. Yes, yeah, and <laughs> she was exposing his advertisers during the breaks. They're all like antidepressant companies, and she's like, "Why are so many antidepressants being introduced into the culture?" And oh, and you have to find the clip and watch it. But Anderson Cooper just backpedals so fast. <laughs> It's like you're a CIA trained journalist. You should get your shit together. That's what we learned at the Ron Paul Peace and Liberty, uh, Peace and Prosperity con- event. That like Raytheon, these conglomerates of pro war, would be on the board of like CNN and media. So of mm. course they don't want to want right. like these attention going on to these wars and kind of like belittle it a little bit and uh, not draw too much attention because they're making money. They're making bank. They right. have people to to answer to and it's a money machine right right and, that, and that's not free markets you know people right. want to say well those are businesses that's a regulatory capture is right. what that is right right, right. 
Well, it's just like when the Atlantic Council is, you know, is one of the people, one of the groups that helps the, control the censorship of Facebook. And then you look at who donates to the Atlantic Council, and you have, you have, you know, every single, you know, military industrial complex com- company. Then you also have, you know, other, you know, Saudi Arabia, Israel, the Department of Defense, the Department of State, all donating money to this think tank, which it's like, it's not really like an independent, you know, think tank, because if they're being controlled by these governments, you know, because money talks, you know, and that's how they're going to be putting out what, whatever work they're doing. And yeah, they, they want, if they're not going to, people aren't going to donate it to them if their agenda isn't covered. Right. And it's, it, censorship just isn't, it's not a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So wrapping up with the, all of this, um, in terms of libertarians and the Koch brothers, I, again, I think, uh, I'm glad that there was a rift. We would not have had the uh, Mises Institute and Lou Rockwell fighting hard mm. and uh, putting that together. And you wouldn't have Ron Paul aiding all that together. And for me, uh, when I got into this, I used to heavily visit the anti-war uh, website, and uh, which led me to the, like, the Lou Rockwell website. and had no idea like, the, the bigger picture and how all these people were connected. And uh, the foundations and friendships they made along the way, uh, that the direction still is, is freedom. There will be disagreements, sure. But at least uh, at the end game that we want to go to, I could greatly follow. I think it's a great uh, way to go as well. I think uh, Rothbard, I, even if sometimes uh, the Cato Institute doesn't acknowledge him, uh, everyone else kind of knows by now. <laughs> and uh, I think the Reason Magazine editorial about... Um, uh, David Koch passing away acknowledges Austrian economics. So I think that's a good thing because they're very heavily into Chicago economics. So I think uh, some of these weird uh, animosities or little side uh, quarrels are finally being put aside. And uh, hopefully that builds to a better, stronger relationship. Yeah, I, re- I read through real quick. I read through, like, I uh, looked up the Kochs and Ron Paul or something, and I found this link on the Mises website. Um, showing David Koch's list of books that he recommends or something. And I was like, oh, this is all like good, solid stuff. And if a billionaire is reading this stuff, mm-hmm. you're like, man, I'd much rather him reading that than whatever like George Soros right now. Keynes, I'm sure they right. all read Keynes. Right, right. Well, t- we'll do a whole episode of Keynes. A lot of weird stuff that, that was just, right. you recently just discovered about that. Um, him and his weird pedo island. I don't know. We'll mm-hmm. see. It's maybe it's a torch that these people pass on to each other. I don't know. Right. It's our legacy. And I think it's our legacy as part of being our tradition ourselves to continue to improve that and make that choice brighter and stronger and provide better reason arguments for it. And it's going to be up to our generation uh, to keep lighting that torch and passing that relay to the next one. And like with how, you know, with you look, you look at Murray Rothbard and then you look at, you know, Warren Buffett. So like I... I think I heard it on like you know podcast or something somewhere. And um, Warren Buffett, when he was when he was you know in his teens, he was wanting to learn more and more about you know the Great Depression. And his dad suggested to him uh, America's Great Depression, you know the book written by Murray Rothbard. And that that was like he did like a whole like something in college, like a dissertation or something about it in college about you know the Great Depression. And like that was like the first one of the first like main books about the Great Depression that he really like was all about. And you, know, you see how it can like. Warren Buffett's praised by, you know, the left and stuff, but it really just crossed lines because, you know, they all have the same idea of just, you know, working together as people and humans rather than, you know, looking for solutions to the government. It's a means ends argument, right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. if, if we look at what our priorities are and we look at what people are doing in the world, you can figure out if they are an ally or a foe pretty quickly. And uh, the more people that figure that out and get their thinking together, the easier it'll be. Right. So with that, we'll close off this uh, Libertarian Crusaders podcast show episode. Uh, If you can look down in the description, you'll see our new subscribe store. We have uh, Libertarian Crusader patches coming out. We have uh, Discord as well and T-shirts coming out also very soon. Uh, So, Deus Volt, stay liberated. Get off my property. (laughs) Among free men, learning is self-discipline, not the gift of experts. Forced training is for slaves. Great.